Hello, I'm Elizabeth Hanson Smith, uh, Professor Emeritus at California State University, Sacramento, where for many years I was the director of the graduate TESOL program. I have worked a lot with software. I was lead designer for the Oxford Picture Dictionary interactive version, and uh, I'm on the pedagogical team of Live Action English Interactive, which uses TPR on the computer. I've also written Constructing the Paragraph, which is free online, and anybody is welcome to use it. And you'll find uh, the link below at GeoCities uh, will uh, give you access to all of these things I've mentioned. My topic today is the effect of technology on second language acquisition, and vice versa. So there's a somewhat tongue-in-cheek quality here. My topics today, which I'll be considering in a somewhat spiral fashion, are what are the problems facing call researchers, what is second language acquisition, and are there any solutions to these problems? In preparing for this talk, I ran across a very interesting and provocative article, uh, Clark's 1994, Media Will Never Influence Learning. And since this article doesn't appear online anywhere, I have used Delille's summary to give you an idea of what Clark's point is. Clark says, uh, Clark's emphasis is that instructional methods differ from instructional media. Methods are ways of working to bring about a change in cognitive processes. Media are the means by which the method is delivered to the learner. Media attributes are the delivery methods which a particular medium can offer, for example, zooming in video. There is no single media attribute that serves a unique cognitive effect for some learning task, so the attributes must be proxies for some other variables that are instrumental in learning gains. Uh, in other words, the medium is not giving us a method. My own metaphor for this is that media are like the delivery truck. We are grateful to UPS, but the content of the box isn't theirs. So Delille's summary of Clark is that the learning effects demonstrated are due not to the delivery method, but to superior instructional methods being built into computer-based learning situations. Clark claims that media research is a triumph of enthusiasm over substantive examination of structural processes in learning and instruction. So let's take a look at those structural processes. What do we know about second language acquisition? I'm sure you're all familiar with Krashen's input and monitor models. Uh, there is some input the learner acquires some parts of this or creatively constructs and adds to his interlanguage. Uh, the learning that he undergoes uh, is related mainly to the monitor which governs what kind of output can be generated. This is a very simple version of this model, however. By 1981, Krashen has a much more elaborated version of the input model and he takes into account the impact of learning on acquisition to some extent. Clearly, he never strayed from the idea that input is primary in the process of second language acquisition. By the 90s, uh, largely due to people like Swain, we have a much greater uh, realization of the importance of interaction and output. And the interactionist model here demonstrated by Chappelle, which I think is a nice figure for this, includes the input, but also noticing, awareness, apperception. You have, the learner has to notice something before they can learn it, before it can become comprehensible. Uh, comprehension leads to intake or uptake, um, as some researchers call it. And the learner then can integrate what is taken in, what is noticed, into uh, the system, the linguistic model that the learner is building internally. And this will then result in output. So this is a far more complicated model than we've been looking at with Krashen. 
Earl Stevick included in his uh, 1980 book uh, a wonderful article describing the Levertov machine. And it was a way of uh, trying to get at the complexity of second language acquisition and trying to account for things that other models ignored, in effect. Uh, you'll notice how important the social forces are and the reactions of others at both ends of this spectrum, how people uh, treat you during school, what others feel about your learning, how they respond to your output. These are all important parts of your teaching and learning experience. Um, there are, there's more than one monitor. There's a, there's a, a monitor in effect for acquisition. You, you know that you check yourself. Even native speakers will check themselves and, and apply a monitor as they speak. So Stevic adds a governor for acquisition and a governor for learning. Also, the Eureka effect, uh, when a learner says, oh, I learned that in school, that's what it goes here, and it becomes part of acquisition, implies that you can't separate acquisition and learning f completely. They're obviously learning leaks into acquisition, just as teaching can have effect on what you acquire as well as what you are learning. Uh, at the center of the Levitoff machine is the rheostat, or that turns up the generator. Uh, students notice things more when they're turned on, when uh, that rheostat is going up. Their uh, threshold of acquisition is, is lowered and they are able to get at um, things and learn them better. So this is a, a much more complicated model. Stevic makes some very important points about acquisition and learning. Uh, however, we have to keep in mind that this was somewhat tongue-in-cheek. He really was, was trying to overwhelm us with this complexity, and the, the, the picture I've given you on the previous slide is really a simplification of his uh, ultimate Levertoff machine. So I, I think it demonstrates to us um, how difficult it is to grasp what it is we are trying to research when we look at second language acquisition and call. The kinds of awarenesses that Stevic leads us to, I think, uh, present Plato's problem, as it's called in philosophy. That is, how do we acquire so much knowledge on the basis of so little information? Landauer and Dumay in 2004 present Plato's problem in this way. A typical American seventh grader knows the meaning of 10 to 15 words today that she didn't know yesterday. Most of these words must have been acquired through reading because she already has a full oral vocabulary. However, she's acquired less than one word through direct instruction since yesterday. And remember, we're talking about averages and large numbers here. About one word for every 20 paragraphs read in a school text goes from wrong to right on a daily vocabulary test yet the typical seventh grader would have read fewer than 50 paragraphs since yesterday. So how did she acquire all those words she didn't encounter in the text? Plato's solution for this mystery of excessive knowledge is that people are born with most of their knowledge and need only hints or contemplation to retrieve it. Of course, we aren't platonic idealists anymore. Landauer and Dumais' solution to this problem is latent semantic analysis, a general theory of acquired similarity and knowledge representation. They used the Grolier Encyclopedia, which most of you are familiar with, I would ex expect, to analyze 30,000 articles plus with a mean text length of 151 words. Some of the articles were only one sentence long, for example, Constantinople, see Istanbul, and longer articles were cut off at 2,000 characters simply because of the massive processing that was needed to, to deal with that many words. They did 4.6 million words of text altogether in their analysis. Um, the words were placed in a matrix, each column representing an article and each row some of the 60,000 word types that appeared in at least two articles. So each cell contained the frequency with which a word appeared in the article. So this is the table that was produced 
with the articles across the columns and the words in the rows, and the x's representing the frequencies of occurrence. This table was then further reduced to vectors weighted for how often a word appeared and in how many different articles. Uh, so further algebraic matrices were applied. And you can get the software that Landau and Demay actually used and try this out for yourself if you have a very large computer. Uh, the address is at the end of the references. So the latent semantic analysis is able to produce a model of a general learning mechanism. The computer could determine logarithmically what words, that is, strings of characters, uh, appear in what context, that is, with other words or strings. But even more importantly, what words might appear in similar contexts. Uh, Landauer and Dumais then had the machine take the synonym portion of the TOEFL, and the machine approximated the average scores of EFL applicants to U.S. colleges. The model got 64.4% correct. The students got 64.5% correct. Now remember, this is all without the computer actually understanding the words being tested and without being able to use grammar and syntax for cues. So Landau and Dumais conclude that a substantial portion of the information needed to answer vocabulary test questions can be inferred from the context, the statistics of usage. And this is really a short-circuiting the need for a Chomskyan universal grammar or uh, an acquisition device in the brain. It's very interesting conclusions. As Landauer and Dumais put it, the machine acquired knowledge about synonymity from the kinds of experience on which a human relies. That is, the hundreds of billions of neural networks in the brain can exploit both indirect inference and co-occurrence relations, both within and beyond a particular text. Let me offer you several observations made by Landauer and Dumais. First of all, weak local constraints, for example, the search for synonymity, can combine to produce strong inductive effects. And the effects of constraints that are very weak in themselves may emerge only in very large, naturally generated ensembles. In other words, experiments with miniature or concocted subsets of language may not be sufficient to reveal or assess the forces that hold conceptual knowledge together. In other words, to learn a language, you need masses of input data as encountered naturally by people. Also, knowledge comes not just from an immediate stimulus or a direct experience with something, uh, for example, encountering a word in a text, but from everything else that you've ever experienced. Uh, playground language, meeting people and making assumptions about them that turn out to be true or false. Uh, every perception, every experience you've had will enable you to understand language better. Landauer and Dumay believe that the uh, latent semantic analysis model accounts for larger aspects of human knowledge, that is, beyond synonym synonymity. Uh, so to go back to our initial example, First through fifth graders learn about 10 words a day, despite learning only about one word a week through direct instruction. This is generally agreed upon by researchers. This is possible because by late grade school, a child will have read about 3.8 million words. The direct learning effect, effect calculated using the latent semantic analysis model would be 0 .0007 words per word encountered times 70, the approximate number of words in a paragraph. But the indirect effect is 0.15 words per word encountered. So the average student reading 50 paragraphs daily would learn 10 new words per day. My own analogy is to a jigsaw puzzle where the first two or three pieces you have are very hard to uh, put together with other pieces, but as you complete the puzzle, the
the last few pieces are very easy to put into their place. Uh, this is like semantic analysis. The more you know, the more you've read, the more easily you are able to make sense of words. Latent semantic analysis also explains why expert readers get more out of what they read. There is inductive power inherent in the possession of large bodies of old knowledge, that is, knowledge previously acquired. By the end of secondary school, a knowledge of 100,000 words is probably a low estimate. The expert reading her two millionth paragraph has a 0.56 probability of correct extrapolation when encountering a new term in, say, an academic journal, while the novice encountering only his second sample of a similar context has a 0.14 probability of correct meaning. He is about a quarter as able to read for meaning. There is inductive power inherent in the possession of large bodies of old knowledge. So to return to Clark, uh, do media ever influence learning? Is the medium the message? Back in 1994, Clark told us, no, it was not. If you drill and grill on the computer, it's no different than doing it in the classroom. You can click for animation or zoom for details, but these are delivery, not content or methods. Only superior methods can produce better learning. Therefore, call researchers are in fact investigating just methods. However, does call provide us with superior methods of delivering instruction as Delille believed? Or does it give us superior quantities of natural language, uh, what Landauer and Dume are emphasizing? Or is there still something else? This is what I mean by something else. Uh, in a recent report in, a, in the New York Times, Carr has a few anecdotes. Uh, a four-year-old, when asked what she was fishing for behind the TV, replied, the mouse. Another four-year-old asked to see the movie she had just viewed on broadcast television at the babysitter's house. When told it wasn't on TV just then, she asked, is it broken? You point, you click, you don't have to wait. You don't have to allow others to select what you read or listen to. This is the call environment nowadays. And by the way, this is a picture of my 16-month-old granddaughter with a cell phone and the computer, and she has her own bookmarks. So possibly both method in the largest sense and input and the methods of input as well as motivational quality, are all superior in a call environment. Putting together all these sources, I think we can come to some tentative conclusions. Methods may in fact be seen as less important than the delivery of input, and how input is delivered, so I don't completely agree with Clark at all. Masses of input are more important than direct instruction, so we're somewhere back to crash in it, at least in part, and that's supported by what Landauer and Dume have to say about input. Authentic content is more important for indirect learning than prepared text with narrow foci. And again, this is based on what Landauer and Dume's latent semantic analysis can tell us. Human readers can readily disambiguate terms through local context using their hundreds of billions of parallel computational elements. Hence, concordancers should be important tools in language input because you are getting a certain degree of context when you look up something through a concordancer. Since humans are exposed to spoken language as well as print, newer forms of oral web interaction, such as the voice over internet protocols, should become increasingly important for communication beyond classmates and teachers. Since in language, learners can produce the same events that they perceive and receive feedback on their approximations, remembering Stevik's Levertov machine, opportunities for communicative production are very important to expanding the knowledge base and neural networks. 
some degree of autonomy in the selection of media and learning goals appears to be useful both for motivation and in making inferences about content and linguistic structures. The media-rich, internet-enhanced, computer-based environment offers multiple opportunities to expand input and interaction far beyond schoolroom walls. Additionally, it offers the potential for learner autonomy and motivation. Taking into account these ideas, what can we conclude about the proper functions of call, and by extension, what should be the scope of call research? First of all, content-based learning is important. It provides the contextual clues that allow inferred induction to develop. Authentic, extensive materials are important. They provide the large masses of information necessary for inferential learning. Learners need opportunities to direct their own learning. Opportunities for creative output and interaction are also important. Uh, for example, in extensive project-based learning involving an authentic audience. They allow learners to experiment and refine hypotheses about what they are learning. Of lesser importance in second language acquisition and hence in researching call are the learning of discrete items, that is parts of speech and decontextualized sentences, uh, and test judging rote learning for example, lists of vocabulary items. And we've all seen far too much research that depends on not only on a small sample of students, but on highly discrete items for testing results. And finally, I think the most significant problem is how to control the variables when dealing with autonomous learner choices, massive amounts of authentic materials, as in extensive reading and long-term projects, and multiple media resources for both receptive and expressive communication, and often all of these at the same time. So I leave this problem to my colleagues to resolve. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you will look at the notes at the end of this uh, talk, which indicate where you can replicate Landauer and Dumais research. Thanks very much. An outline of this paper may be viewed at Wikispaces, and links to my other papers and, and work can be found at my homepage at CSUS. An outline of this paper may be viewed at Wikispaces, and links to my other papers and work uh, can be found at my homepage at CSUS.